was born in 1936, uh, right at the height of the Depression. I grew up in, in, in New York City in the Bronx. I was born in Brooklyn, went to Brooklyn Technical High School, went off to Tufts University to become a mechanical engineer. And I went to the City College of New York. There were about a dozen of us who graduated engineering school at City College at roughly the same time, and we all went up to MIT. I got a job at Bell Labs. I really knew nothing about Bell Labs, but people told me, well, if you can get a job there, you have to go there. So I went to, to Bell Labs, and uh, while I was at Bell Labs, I uh, pursued a PhD. For me, the big moment was about two years into being at Bell Labs, there was a reorg and I got called into my new department head's office and he said he wanted me to work on this radio system. The downside of that was that I didn't know anything about radio at all. The upside was I got to work with Phil Porter. Phil was um, older than I was by about a dozen years maybe. He was an experienced engineer, an electrical engineer and physicist, PhD. He was a Southern gentleman, he was a Kentucky gentleman. He really taught me everything. We started this work in January of 66, and we spent uh, probably six months on the first proposal. We wrote a memorandum describing the system and its economics and how, how big cells should be and stuff like that. And um, really nobody cared in 66. All of a sudden, out of the blue, the Federal Communications Commission opened up a docket that said, you know, we're thinking of taking a big chunk of spectrum from what was called UHF television and assigning to mobile telephone, but we don't want you to have this brute force system of a one antenna broadcasting 25 and 30 miles. We want something more sophisticated than that. The great Bell Laboratories could not respond and say, we don't know. They had to respond with something. And what they said to the FCC was, we really need to study this. And we were the two guys in Bell Labs who knew what the system could look like. And so we spent months going around the company giving talks about it. And everyone wanted to hear about cellular. And so I got promoted, Dick and Phil and a few other people uh, were put into my group, which grew over a couple of years. And the end product was the report, which covered everything. It covered the radio aspects, it covered the, the switching and control aspects. It looked at the economics. I was the editor of that uh, report. My one big individual contribution to Cellular was about how the system would grow. You have to start these systems with big cells because you can't afford to put in hundreds of cells. But as it grows, the cells have to get smaller. And all the original proposals would suddenly have a new size of cell, half the radius, would appear. And it still required dozens of new cells all at once. And then one day, I suddenly had this idea by sharing coverage between the two sizes of cell at the same place at the same time, you could actually make a very gradual growth happen. When I described it to people, they said, well, it can't be, you know, it can't be that easy. And it was. Phil's big idea in around 1970 was to use directional antennas on the towers. Not in the center, which is what everybody thought it would be, but at the corners aiming inward and it allowed us to use the same frequency much closer together so that we could carry many more conversations per square mile. I remember him coming into my office and saying, you know, we should not be giving dial tone to people. We should dial offline and then, when it's all ready, send that dialed number into the system because we're wasting about 15 seconds of channel time on every single call. So he invented dial send, which billions of people now treat as the normal way a cell phone works. There was a lot of political back and forth going on, and it actually took the FCC 12 years before they actually allowed the system to, uh, to be built and sold to the public. But 
They did allow a test system in Chicago, which grew substantially and proved in all of the technology aspects. It also proved in the market acceptance. When you look at the whole system, it was a, a technological system, and you had to understand the economics. How many channels did you need to make the cost come out right? Things like that. I was good at that. I was good at putting together disparate ideas. So I made a role for myself. I believed that the technology was right over the horizon. And Bell Labs was the kind of place where if you were passionate about an idea, they'd give you the resources you needed. Phil Porter is the great unsung hero of cellular. His contributions are second to no one's. And yet, somehow over the years, Joel Engel and I have gotten a bunch of nice recognition, and Phil didn't. Phil should have been there with us for the National Medal of Technology, for the Draper Prize. Phil was nominated posthumously for this recognition by people he worked with 40 years ago. So they knew, and we all knew that, that he hadn't been recognized properly for his tremendous contributions. So that's, I mean, the fact that those people came out to do that really says it all.